Today is uh, Bob Posen. Bob joined our faculty last year and taught the LCA course in the fire curriculum and is teaching again uh, this year. Bob has had a long and distinguished uh, career in the area of securities law, regulation, and asset management. Uh, Bob's a graduate of the uh, Yale Law School, taught law for a period of time at Georgetown and New York University. Uh, <clears throat> following that, he um, uh, was in, in public service, uh, working in the general counsel's office for the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, and then subsequently was a uh, partner for uh, Kaplan and Drysdale, where he led the uh, banking and securities practice uh, down there in Washington, D.C. Uh, subsequently, um, Bob joined uh, Fidelity Investments, where he rose to vice chairman and was president of Fidelity Management a research company, which is the actual uh, investment advisor to uh, the Fidelity family of, uh, of funds. Um, uh, in addition to uh, all of this, and in teaching in our required curriculum, Bob is also the chairman of MFS uh, Investment Management, uh, which is an asset management company with 200 billion in assets under management for uh, uh, 5 million uh, investors worldwide. Uh, Bob has been and remains today a very active publisher in, these, uh, in this area. Uh, including along the way um, a, uh, a textbook, one of the first textbooks comparing uh, 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 you know, the regulation of banks to other financial institutions, and also um, has one of the leading textbooks on mutual funds. So we're uh, delighted to have Bob with us today on this subject that uh, he's addressing today. He knows where he speaks, and uh, we're very glad to have him. Thank you. Please welcome. <laughs> Well, my mother would have been proud of that introduction. Uh, today, uh, I, I thought we'd begin by using uh, a few slides to make sure everybody is on the same page. Some of you may have gone to Rob Kaplan's session on uh, uh, background to the uh, financial crisis. So I thought we'd go over a few slides just so that we all agree on how we got there, or generally how we got there. and then. Uh, we'll look at a more Socratic method, though no cold calls, promise, promise uh, as to what Washington has done, what they might do, what they should do, uh, and uh, whether any of these things are, are, are going to work. So starting with these slides, uh, I mean, the first question is, um, I think you have to ask yourself is, how did a, a housing slump become a global financial crisis. Uh, and if we look at that question, then we need to start by saying, well, uh, how do we look at this as a housing crisis? Is this a housing crisis that's so extraordinary uh, that it just by its very large quality, uh, it uh, produced a global financial crisis? Uh, we see that, yes, there's been a rise in housing prices mainly since 2004. There's been a sharp drop in housing prices in the last year, probably in the 12 to 18 percent uh, 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 range. Uh, why the usual intermediaries uh, had some new products and probably some old greed buyers. We have naive buyers, we have deceptive buyers, we have speculative buyers, and we have the normal result on the real economy which is <clears throat> lower employment, revenues to decline, et cetera. Now, the question is, why was it different this time? And the most important thing, I think, is that we had a secondary market. We had a secondary market for securities, so you had lots of the originators who were selling the mortgages into pools. And in these pools, uh, they issued a variety of tranches, uh, which uh, constituted slices of uh, interest and principal, all diced up in different ways, rated in different ways, and they were sold uh, to global investors. Many of them got AAA ratings, and they were sold throughout the, the world. So I guess part of the reason we say here is we got a lot of global investors who held these securities, and they were in a variety of pools. The other thing that's critical to understand about the roots of this crisis is we essentially replicated the mismatch of the SNL crisis. For those of you who were around in the 80s, we had long mortgages, 15 and 30 year mortgages, matched against short term deposits. Here, we didn't have to do it, but we did it. Most of these trusts 
that were set up, these off-balance sheet trusts, were holding 15, 30-year mortgages, various types of mortgages, but they were financed by three-month and six-month paper. So that meant that they had to be rolled over and rolled over. Why was it three months or six months? It was three months or six months because uh, they had lower interest rates. So when you had the combination of mortgages from around the country in these relatively opaque pools, uh, they were off balance sheet, they weren't in the banks and the sponsors, and you had this mismatch. As soon as you had a problem where people sensed that the quality of the underlying mortgages was going down, that the default rates were going up, you had a number of things happen that were much broader than we've ever seen before. Uh, we had uh, issues of, uh, of uh, uh, the... These people... Uh, we had uh, people throughout the world who held these things who started to get worried. And we had uh, organizations that, like bank sponsors, that had different obligations, some of which weren't in the documents, some of which were, to deal with this short-term paper. So when you had paper that had to be rolled over every three months or six months, so somebody had to deal with that. And what we found out was that a lot of these people Citigroup, for instance, took back on its balance sheet $40 billion of off-balance sheet securities. Why did it do that? Because it turned out it had an informal obligation to the off-balance sheet trust to continue liquidity, which means to continue buying the three-month and the six-month paper. So as a result, <coughs> we had very quickly a short-term uh, <coughs> crisis. And the other thing is that this was overlaid with credit default swaps and other derivatives, meaning that there were insurance companies, banks, and other people who wrote insurance on whether or not mortgage pools would default or not. So we had many insurance companies, some of which had only done municipal securities, relatively safe securities, who wound up doing insurance in a much broader way. And these credit default swaps uh, at the moment are about 55 trillion, so it's a lot of credit default swaps. So, <clears throat> what are the results here? The results are one of six mortgages now exceeds the value of their home. We have lots of surprise bankruptcies of financial institutions, and we have uncertainty about the location of future losses. Uh, so this is what's causing a freezing up of the market for short-term debt. This is, again, an unusual thing, is that we start off with a debt problem, not a stock problem. And afterwards, we've now wound up with a short selling problem and a stock price problem. So if we put it all together, we say, what are the crucial factors here? Yes, we had a housing slump, but what was different is it was securitized across the world, and so we have lots of people who hold this across the world. Second of all, that it was done in a particularly opaque way. It wasn't on the balance sheets of the institutions that sponsored them. It wasn't on the Citicorp's balance sheet or Credit Suisse or UBS, and that these off-balance sheet entities themselves were opaque. Uh, <clears throat> so that once you had a problem, people had a great time figuring out where the losses are. Third of all, <clears throat> you had this mismatch of long and short securities, so you caused the liquidity problem because you had to go and buy this stuff every three months and six months. <clears throat> so think about it. What happened very quickly was that this became a short-term debt problem became a short-term debt problem is that no bank wanted to buy any other bank's paper and no money market fund wanted to buy bank's paper. This is short-term meaning one day, seven days, three months. Why didn't they want to do it? Well, they had seen AIG go down. They had seen Lehman Brothers go down. They had seen Bear Stearns go down. So who will be the next? When my trader comes in and says to me, should I trade with Goldman Sachs today? 
I think to myself, well, if you're not going to trade with Goldman Sachs, who are you going to trade with? But that is the degree of fear. No one knows because of this globalization of securities, because of the opaqueness of the information uh, combined with this liquidity problem, what we see is that we don't know where the losses are. Uh, how much are the losses? Most people have estimated the losses to be somewhere in the six, seven, eight hundred billion dollar losses from what are called subprime and alt A, which is another form of subprime mortgages. How much losses do we have reported? Something like 400, 450 billion. So we know, we know that there are out there another two, three, four hundred billion dollars of losses. We just don't know where they are. And every institution will tell you that they've marked down their mortgages to the right level, and it's only a liquidity problem. Well, we know that half of them are right and half of them are wrong. <laughs> and just to give you a sense is Merrill Lynch's marks for its mortgage-backed securities, it's marked down them about 60%. Citigroup has marked them down by about 30%. Maybe they're slightly different. Maybe they're the same. We don't know. So this is the environment that we're in. We've had a, so you started with a freezing up of short-term loans. And, and that was sort of the immediate problem. Just think about this. If you're going to go and lend some money to somebody for three months, and they're willing to give you 4% above the treasury rate, essentially it's worth 1% to you in three months. So if you're lending them 100000 you get $1,000 more. That's all. And you have the risk of losing it all if the institution goes under. So this is the sorts of dynamics why people wouldn't lend three-month money. Most of the money that's being lent in the overnight market is being lent at one day and maybe at seven days. Then the other event we had was that once this happened and people realized that any financial institution could be had, uh, then we had what I viewed as a very ad hoc decision-making process by the Treasury in which Bear Stearns was saved. We didn't know why Bear Stearns were saved. It didn't follow the procedures that we usually follow for bank bailouts. Then we know why we bailed out Freddie and Fannie Mae. We bailed them out because they were moral obligations of the government. We all knew that there was some sort of implied guarantee by the government, and their paper was held by central banks all around the world. But then, when AIG and Lehman came up over the same weekend, Hank Paulson announced that he wasn't going to bail out either Lehman Brothers or uh, AIG. And then he turned around and he bailed out AIG, but he didn't bail out Lehman Brothers. Why? I don't think we know today why. One theory is that AIG was a big player in the credit default swap market. And therefore, since that market is the most opaque market, $55 trillion, and we have no clearing mechanism, no exchange mechanism, nothing, that people were afraid. They didn't know who was exposed and who was not. Why was Lehman Brothers uh, let go? I believe that Hank Paulson thought that he couldn't just bail out everyone and that people were literally lining up. Municipalities were lining up. Uh, schools were lining up. You know, pretty soon <coughs> supermarkets were going to line up and say, we're too big to fail. And he had to let somebody fail. So Lehman Brothers took the hit. <coughs> After that, once Lehman Brothers went down, then everyone knew that the government wasn't going to guarantee everybody. That's when the most information problems uh, uh, started. And that's when uh, short sellers started shorting all of the major institutions thinking about, well, maybe they'll go down, maybe they won't. And as a result, Morgan Stanley and Goldman both went and became bank holding companies, and they are no longer broker-dealers, they are no longer investment banks. And Merrill Lynch went and got bought out by Bank of America. Now, why did they do that? Basically, <clears throat> if you're a bank, you have two sources on your, uh, of liquidity on your liability side. You have the commercial paper market and you have insured deposits. As an investment bank, you basically have commercial paper. 
The other thing is on your asset side, as a bank, you can both loan money and underwrite. And so therefore, from both sides of your balance sheet, you're much better off being a bank holding company than you are being an investment bank. But you are much more highly regulated as a bank holding company. You have to have much lower leverage. And you also have a more limited scope of activities. So that's pretty much the situation. We had a proliferation, as I say, of a mortgage crisis, of a mortgage problem. It then became a short-term debt problem. And then once we let Lehman Brothers go under, we then had an attack on all the major financial institutions. We no longer have any investment banks in the United States. We used to have five of the biggest in the world. We have zero now. If somebody had told you that a year ago, you wouldn't have believed it. So we've had this huge change. So what I'd like to do now is uh, just give you one more uh, thing. It's sort of saying we have two people running for president, and they know what to do. We're now switching to what <coughs> needs to be done. And so we can say, see that McCain promises reforms to prevent the type of wild speculation that can put our markets at risk. So if we can only figure out what was the kind of wild speculation that put our markets to risk, we will be very safe and we will have a program to stop that. And similarly, Obama is going to set up a financial risk oversight body to identify situations of lending practices that could threaten the entire system before they grow serious. So he's even more ambitious. He's going to stop this thing from ever happening again. So <clears throat> in short, we have two political candidates who have absolutely no idea what to do about this. <laughs> and they, one of them is going to be president in a few weeks, so hopefully they have some good advisors. <laughs> and perhaps more realistically in a campaign of political slogans, this sort of detailed analysis that we'll hopefully get into in a few minutes, people would say is not appropriate. So, Let's begin the discussion. I'm, I've just put up a few categories, legislation that's been passed, new laws that you think should happen, the FDIC, the FDI, <coughs> the Fed, the SEC, accounting, others. So I'd like you to now think about, tell me anything that has been done in response to the crisis that you think is effective or something that you think should be done that hasn't been done. And let's see if we can sort of have a little discussion. Yes. So um, one thing that's underlying kind of the financial malaise is the leverage at the household level. So what I mean by that is that Oh, no, you're, you're right. The debt, the ratio of people's debt to income has gone way up. Right. And, um, so should we, how, would, how are we going to stop that? Tell people to stop borrowing? So there are two components to that. One is kind of there's too much consumer debt, and, and that, that's one component, but the major the major component is kind of the mortgage finance issue. And so I think, to me, it seems like addressing the problem from the bottom up, kind of renegotiating the mortgages on a one-by-one -one basis to keep people in their homes, kind of reduce the amount of leverage that the individual consumer has. From the bottom up is a better is a better solution. So McCain proposed something, you know, buying, buying the mortgage in the face value and renegotiating them to keep people in their homes. I think. That's met a lot of resistance, but something like buying them at a slight discount, renegotiating the mortgages at something closer to market value, and spreading the loss throughout society, to me seems like a way to address this problem from the bottom up. Okay, so this is uh, quite a reason. This is actually, you're just giving a form of Marty Feldstein's proposal, which McCain has sort of adopted, which is let's take all these people who are underwater in their mortgages, meaning that the value of their homes exceeds the mortgage, and let's reduce the amount of mortgage that they have, and we'll give them a lower interest rate, lower principal, whatever they need, right? So anybody have a problem with that? Yeah? It just seems like. We would need legislation to do that. Take my word for it. Yeah. It seems like there are probably open that this would bail out a lot of speculators. Um, you know, and you know, maybe people who were irresponsible borrowers who keep them collected, probably 
Okay, so one, one problem is, are we going to do this for everybody who has a mortgage that we think, well, my mortgage, you know, it's too much principal, too much interest, so I'm just going to reduce it. What do you say? We've already, as taxpayers, written a $750 billion check. No, we haven't written the check yet. Okay, well we, we, we have, have potentially written it. We have, I think, at least $150 to $200 billion that's been committed to. No, 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 no. We, we put the money in, but we haven't lost it yet. Okay, potentially. <laughs> we potentially lost it. There's a big difference between potentially losing and losing. Take my word for it. We've, invested, we've, committed, we've committed, as taxpayers, a lot of capital to... to bail out or at least kind of keep afloat a number of financial institutions. Um, somewhat kind of... But, but, but wait a second. Answer His question is, okay, maybe there are some people who should be bailed out. So tell me, how are we going to define this? Just everybody who has a mortgage in the United States, everybody who has too much debt, we're going to reward those people who took out two big mortgages and took on too much debt. Those are the people we're going to reduce, right? Give them an incentive to be more disciplined in the future, right? Well, I think if we're willing to do it at the institutional level, we should be willing to do it at the, at the home. Your point that we're willing, okay, a very important point that you're making is, and we'll get to it, is we did this a lot of, very little of the legislation involves helping the individual in the mortgage market. And I think that, that you have put your finger on a very important point about what's done so far. The problem is, how do we define this group? How are we going to define this group? Yes? I worry about what's the true value of like, the fair value market. So The fair value of what? Of the of house? The house. So How do we know the fair value of the house? There's no way to find out. OK. But let's assume we pick a fair value. He's still saying, is, so we bring down the mortgage to the fair value of everyone in the United States? And what if the fair value drops tomorrow? Well, then we got to bring it down to more, I think. <laughs> so look, I think we've pushed this far enough, but I think this is a very, very good point, is as we will see, almost none of the bailout legislation goes to the individual homeowner. And if you believe that the underlying problem is the housing market, that is a serious deficiency. But one of the reasons that they don't do it may be because people are more worried about the institutional framework, et cetera. But another reason is because we have a hell of a time defining who should be helped here. We, we somehow figured out that these nine institutions, the banks, we ought to give them $125 billion, and we picked the nine largest, but we don't want to pick the nine largest mortgage holders because that doesn't seem like a good idea. So it's a, you made a very good point, good counter-argument. Let's have some more ideas as to what has been done or should be done that's effective. Alex? Um, I think the rating agencies... Uh, the rating, we're going to put them under other here. Right. So what should we do with the rating agencies? Um, I think they need to They're be... culprits, right? They're bad guys. They gave all these good ratings. They shouldn't have done it. I don't think they're culprits, but they, they definitely failed us. And I, I think they need to be exposed to um, some of the regulations that uh, equity, equity research arms and brokerages were exposed to uh, at the time of the tech bubble. Uh, tell me what those are. Well, for, I mean, and again, it wouldn't be the exact same, the exact same regulations, but one example would be that there's mixed incentives. So in the case of, of equity research back in the beginning of the 21st century, yeah. um, they, you know, they had an incentive to deliver positive research in order, in order to win investment banking. So, so how are you going to prevent rating agencies from having an incentive to deliver positive ratings? So, for example, the issuers of securities shouldn't be the ones compensating the Oh, okay. Agencies. Well, here's a fundamental issue. You got, you're right there. So right now the rating agencies are paid by the issuers. So who do you want them? Who do you want to pay for? Um, you know, presume, I mean, a little louder, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, in theory, there should be a pool of money with the. Well, where's this pool of money coming from? What is that? Is this part of the 150 billion? Is this the bailout money now? We can put out money for paying the rating agencies now? Yeah, yeah, it would probably be a small percentage of that. But no, that's not necessarily what I'm recommending. Presumably, the, the purchasers of these securities. Oh, the investors. Yeah. So, well, let me ask you a question, Alex. If these ratings were so useful, how come we've gone 50 years with no investors paying for it, only the issuers? Maybe, maybe somehow the investors don't think they're so useful. Then why are they being gotten? 
Uh, it's, it's a good question because this isn't the first time Gateway this has failed. I, I just think that there are a lot because, because it's probably part of the reason is there's a uh, asymmetry in size that the issuers are much, in many cases, larger institutions than the investors are. So if the investors could act collectively. Um, oh, yeah, we got all those small pension funds, only 300 billion, and we only have 200 billion, and you know. Some people are down to 900 billion like Fidelity. Yeah, they, they wouldn't have any money to pay for ratings, you know. They, they wouldn't want to do anything like that. Right? <laughs> but let's be clear. What, what has happened in rating agencies? We now have some conflict of interest rules, which basically say something like, well, you can't rate a company in the next day go to work for the company. But we haven't dealt with the most basic conflict, which you've put your finger on, right? <coughs> Now, what, another thing people said was that the problem is we just have three big rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and somebody else, I forget. And we did solve that problem because Congress passed legislation, the SEC said, now you have nine rating agencies. You think that helps? You think it helps or hurts? To go from three rating agencies to nine approved by the SEC. I mean, in theory, you would think increased competition among rating agencies would produce better ratings, but there. Anyone have a different view of what happens? Yes. Doesn't that make it worse? Because if the intention is to rate them better, it's like going for the lowest bidder every time. That's right. You, you, you can argue, we just we have a problem of foreign shopping with with grading agencies. If you go to one, they don't give you a good enough rating, you go to the next one. So now instead of having three, you have nine. So arguably we have actually increased the problem of forum shopping by doing that without dealing with your fundamental problem. Okay, so let's get off rating agencies. Let's go into something else. What else do we have here? Yes? I think we should repeal the fact that the Glass Eagle Act is repealed. Oh okay let's get that's, okay we gotta repeal Glass Eagle, you're thinking big. No, repeal the repeal. We need Glass Eagle. You run, oh, you, excuse me. You want to repeal the repeal? Okay, I got it. Reinstate Glass Eagle. I, I think we need investment banks. Well, why why would reinstating Glass Eagle help the whole thing? Well, I think investment banks are a very good purpose, but the day that they behave more like a hedge fund than like an investment bank providing advice, I think. The article, there was an article in The Economist from a year ago saying that if they want to live like hedge funds, they have to be able to die like hedge funds. And I Let me ask you a question. Is it, did, why did these Goldman and Morgan Stanley go and become bank holding companies? Did they become bank holding companies because they were more or less likely to get put into bankruptcy? I think they bought, um, J.P. Morgan bought Chase because they wanted to be able to invest more capital because they were Oh, no, no, we're good. Yes. Uh, the, the, you're making a point you want to put back glass steel. Okay, so I'm saying to you is, well, let's look at the first question. If we put back glass steel, could Goldman Sachs still act like a hedge fund? What would prevent them from acting like a hedge fund if we put back glass steel? I guess it wouldn't undo the situation we have now. Excuse me? I guess it would not undo what we have now. Oh. Absolutely. Goldman Sachs was acting as a hedge fund while it was an investment bank. There was nothing about Glass-Steagall that prevented them from having a high leverage ratio, from taking money in through commercial paper and doing that. If you didn't like the way Glass-Steagall, excuse me, if you didn't like the way Goldman was acting as a hedge fund, Glass-Steagall is interesting, but what I call contiguous but irrelevant. But wasn't, didn't it give them access to much, much greater pool of capital? But, 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 but Goldman Sachs stayed an investment bank. They didn't take advantage of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So they didn't get a bigger access to pool of capital because of the failure of, because of the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So, so you make an interesting point, but, but I, wanna, I wanna press on it. Anyone one else wanna say about Glass-Steagall? Yes. I sort of agree with this. Good. I think in this case, it, it wasn't what caused the problem clearly look at the banks that were sort of allowed to function the way they were because of the repeal of Glass Steagall, those are actually the ones that survived in this case. But if you think about like another outcome of what could have happened, you know, a few months, a year from now, if not for this bailout, you now have these organizations that are not just too big to fail, they're way too big to fail. 
So just what it is. Way too big to fail. Well, it seemed like we pretty much had everybody too big to fail. So has there been any institution that before was not too big to fail that's now too big to fail? Well, but say you had um, J.P. Morgan before, and then you have J.P. Morgan <coughs> Chase. I mean, the fact that they merged made it less likely to fail, probably, because you had a larger capital okay, base. But let, but let me ask you this. Um, yes, it's, a, it's not a less capital base. It isn't by having these things all as bank holding companies now, aren't we less likely to have them fail? Not too big to fail, but not government intervention, but less likely to have They're them. less likely to fail, but if they do fail, it's a larger penalty. Okay. But isn't it more important that they're not going to fail? I mean, it's sort of the, I mean, no one would have thought that these investment banks would have failed, but, you know, Bank of America fails, that's... But, but let's go back to this issue, is you can have failures of financial institutions for two reasons. You can have credit and solvency issues, or you can have short-term liquidity issues. The best thing you can have to combat, and more of these are liquidity issues than solvency issues. The best thing that you can have is two sources of short-term liquidity, not one. So if you don't like Glass-Steagall's repeal, there's a lot you can say for it. But in terms of future failures, it's probably better that these aren't investment banks. But what if those two terms, of, two forms of short-term liquidity, liquidity are highly correlated to the extent that... Oh, no, 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 they are not. The two forms are deposits, insured deposits, and commercial paper. Right, but if you lose a commercial paper and there's a run on the bank, is it? <coughs> well, let, let's, okay, well, I, I want to move on. This gives us a good thing. We took deposit insurance and we moved it from 100,000, this was in the legislation, to 250,000, right? So this is going to be make bank holding companies more likely not to fail. You like that going from 100,000 to 250,000? Is that a good move? Is that a good response? It, it only passed, you know, 472 to nothing. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even know if you look at the deposits that are in banks now, like how much that... I can tell you. Deposits. I can tell you, you raised it from about 20% of the deposits to something like 30 or 40% of the deposits. Mm -hmm. So I guess it makes sense, but it doesn't really... Well, why does it make sense? I mean, it mitigates that increment of run on the bank. Yeah, the risk of that. Okay, any, any argument against it? Why, why wouldn't we put that at 500000 Any argument against this deposit insurance going up? And by the way, this was nothing. In Europe, they, 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 all deposits, anybody, you ever come into a bank, we insure you, guarantee you. <laughs> Do you know that Ireland has insured all its deposits and that its total insurance liability now exceeds its GDP by about two times. <laughs> but no problem. Anybody who goes in a bank, you are insured. You are guaranteed. Right? No problem. Yes? I would say the argument against it is that if, you know, you could, now as a bank, you could lend recklessly. And if someone else is going to pay a bill, fundamentally in the U.S., I don't know how much the premiums the bank paid the FDIC went up. So I don't know if it went up at all. It went up slightly. slightly. It's going to go up. And I don't know how much the FDIC has spent money already with IndyMac and other sort of... Well, what do you think is going to happen to the FDIC's cost over the next 10 years? In terms of the amount they're going to have to pay out. For failed banks. So it's going to go up. Yeah, so that's huge a increase, right. And that's backstop by the Treasury at the end of the day. So and, and it's not just that it will double, but it will roughly double. But what, what incentive, what did we see, those people who know something about the SNL crisis, who raises lots of deposits at high rates? smaller rip like institutions who are not just necessarily smaller people who are in trouble very aggressive banks ones who are in trouble they're the ones who offer CDs in the newspapers but it's all guaranteed by the government like what do I care excuse me like Washington Mutual like Washington Mutual like some Oklahoma thrift that was you know went down with Continental Illinois or something so here's the perfect thing and do you as a depositor care whether the people there are actually making loans to wildcat oilmen. As long as I keep my balance. As long as you keep it under 250. And by the way, if you don't want to deposit as an IRA and the other is in there, you've got two 250,000. And actually, oh. it's Bank of America. It's their money that's so completely that's actually paying okay. the insurance. Okay. So this, by the way, is only temporary to the end of 2009. But I'm willing to bet anyone $1,000 that it continues after the end of 2009. Because this was like 
Every bank in the world wanted this to happen. They've been waiting for it. So what else? This clearly was done to comfort depositors, but it has a huge cost, and it's actually feeding the worst banks. Yes? Um, so I kind of want to go back to your point about targeting the, um, the, the homeowner. Yeah. And so there, there are two types of people who, I, who we should be concerned about. And the first type of people are people whose mortgages are underwater. And the second type of people are people who's, um, who can't make their payments because they had an adjustable rate mortgage and their interest rate has gone up. Okay. Well, um, why should we be concerned about all people whose mortgages are underwater? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not too concerned with you, that. You mean, you mean they pay too high a price for their home because they thought the market would only go up, so we should reward them by reducing? No, no, no. I, so I, I'm trying to say that these are the type of people who, like, I guess, their mortgages are, are risky at this point. But I'm not really concerned about the, the first group of people because, like, in the long term, they're building equity, and you know, if you let them ride this out a little bit. But I'm more concerned about the the people who can't make their mortgage in the short term because these are the people who are actually going to default on their loans. Yes, so, correct. And why can't they pay the mortgage? You don't think there's any relationship between them and how big their mortgage is? How yeah, old? I, yeah, I agree. But I mean, I think that maybe um, these people thought that they could get in, like, they would be able to refinance their loan um, whenever, so if they get into just worth, or just worth mortgage, they figure after five years I can refinance my loan if I need to install the sole. Okay, case. okay, I got it. So I got it. I got now, it. So anybody who can't pay the loan, we want to give them the money to pay, right? No, no, no. So, so I mean, what I, what, I, what I was wondering is, would it make sense to force banks to continue the, the interest rate or the terms of the loan that they that they um, originally started the, adjust, the adjustable rate mortgage? So so basically, I oh, think you're saying don't let it go up. Don't let it go up. Okay. So, now why should why should it not go up? Well, you know, I, I think it does two things here. I mean, I think the first thing that it does is it penalizes banks for irresponsible lending. For oh, irresponsible lending. You mean when Josh McGee came in to see me, and he actually was a pretty low credit, and he's buying this house seems a little overextended, and I figured out. God, I've got to put some money in a loan loss reserve for a guy like this. So I can't give him a 5% loan. I'm going to give him a 5% loan for two years, and then it's going to go up to 7% and then go to 9%. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to make a loan to Joe Schmidt. Well, well, well more, mortgage brokers, I, where they maybe shouldn't have made a loan to Joe. And, I mean, well, what do you mean? I, I, Should I, I, did I, Joe, I, whose Joe, fault is that, Joe or the mortgage brokers? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Both, okay. But, so, I mean, but basically, what, what this does is I think that it, um, it penalizes the banks for irresponsible lending. The banks will take a hit to profitability if they, have, if they have to keep a lower interest rate, but it's less than a hit than if the person defaults on a loan. Well, wait a thing. second. If that's true, then why wouldn't the bank do it voluntarily? Um, because, I mean, it's, it's, it still hits a profitability. I mean, well, wait a second. If, if, the, if it was in the bank's interest that to lower the rate or not let it go up because then they wouldn't have a default, why wouldn't they do it? Well, maybe they figured at this point they might get bailed out. I mean, the, the bank is going to get bailed out? Well, I mean, the government's already bailing, is bailing the banks out. It's like buying these bad assets. So at this point, they don't necessarily have, have an incentive to do it. Okay, well, let's, 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 instead of pushing that too far in light of time here, one of the things we do is the government is going to buy troubled assets now. That's one of the, that was, in fact, that was Paulson's biggest program. Government buy troubled assets, right? So how's that going to happen exactly? The government's going to go around and buy troubled assets. So all you I, people who can't pay, we're, we're going to find all the mortgages where the people can't pay, and we're going to buy them. I, I never thought that was a good idea. But you didn't think that was a good idea. But you see, if I'm the government and I buy them, then I can say no more increase in rate. If I'm a bank, I may not want to do that. Well, I know the bank. In fact, bank. Sheila Baer, the FDIC, had in, a year ago said to all the banks, voluntarily modify these mortgages. You know how many were modified? about 1%. So now we can buy these mortgages. In fact, the act says when the government buys troubled loans, it then has an obligation to the best of its ability to modify the underlying mortgages to get these people a better deal. So all we got to do is figure out how to buy these troubled mortgages. Yes? Yeah, actually, I think a lot of these, I'm not for bailing out the homeowner. I think a lot of people going home who shouldn't be owning homes. And even if we were to adjust their adjust their payments, I think we still have, they still have much, too much debt on the balance sheet, on the personal balance sheet, they should. I mean, go then they should. How, how much should they have? Well, exactly. I, I Could you give forward. me the exact percentage? I want to know. Well, I, I go forward basis, I think that, that on a cumulative basis, people shouldn't have, be allowed to have more than 80% LTV on the home. Oh, really? A, a, ATV I, on the home, but not their total on the home, 80%. Well, you can't, it, it's very hard as a credit, as a, I mean, you're extending credit at home. Yeah. Done, but, so you won't allow anyone to make a 10% down payment. That's not allowed. No, I, I think, 
I think as a, as a go for it, it would be combine uh, home equity line of credit. Okay, case. we push this hard now. Okay, so what are you, how are you going to buy these troubled assets? The government now has. I don't support money. Oh, you don't support? Do you support anything else here? Do you want to? <laughs> do you, do you, what do you want to do? So, what do you want to do? I for, in a, in a, in a different, uh, okay, give me that one. Easing, uh, not easing, but at least clarifying rules as far as private capital making their way to banks. Okay, private capital. You mean private? Private, private equity. The, the Fed has already done it. They have clarified it. I'm sorry. They just put out a release about three weeks ago, okay. and they said that private equity can now go up to 15% of banks and can get certain people on well, boards. It may not go as far as you like. It may not just go as far as you like. But the Fed is accommodating new sources of capital and has made its rules much more lenient for private equity. Take my word for it. But I want to go back. I want to go uh, before banks couldn't go up over 9.9%. They could have no seats. Now they can go up to 15% and have several seats, OK? Private equity in banks. So I want to get back to troubled assets. Remember, Hank Paulson went to Congress and he said, you have to give me this authority and $700 billion to buy troubled assets. He didn't even think of recapitalizing those banks. He went to buy the troubled assets. Then he thought, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should buy these banks. Yes. <coughs> Just to go back a few steps on the thing we've been, we've been talking about, could we isolate um, homeowners who, for whom the houses are their first houses, uh, as opposed to like people who have a second house and the problem paying their? Okay, well that's a good idea. We should look at first house. <coughs> good. That would be a good start of criteria. I don't want to press this further, only to say that it is very difficult to define this group. Starting with people with first homes is a good start but it's a difficult group to define. We need to go, since we only have about 20 minutes, we need to talk about troubled assets and recapitalization of banks. That's the key to this whole legislation. That's where all this money is going. So let's talk about buying troubled assets. We now have 500, excuse me, $450 billion of the 700 billion is allocated toward buying troubled assets. The other 250 is going to recapitalize banks by buying preferred stock with warrants. We've already spent 125 billion of the 250 for nine banks, and we now have the Treasury put out regs this week saying, all the rest of the banks in the United States, come on in and we'll decide whether you'll get the other 125 billion. So we have two huge chunks of money, and let's address those. Are either of those good ideas? Either of those good ideas? Yes. Wait, we, we need somebody new. Somebody volunteer. Let's trouble the assets, recapitalization of banks. Somebody want to take a shot? Yes. So as to the, the second part of that, the trillion fifty for the banks, I think that one of, it seems to me that one of the issues that has been going forward is that the idea behind it seems to be to increase liquidity that these banks have just been pouring the cash. So it actually hasn't been having much of an effect because they just say, great, you just gave me $125 billion, now my balance sheet looks better. No way am I going to lend it out to anybody. Excellent point. So one of the interesting things is we gave $125 billion in preferred stock to nine banks, nine large banks. We also took warrants as the government. We put some conditions on it, but in terms of executive comp and corporate governance. But one thing we didn't do is require that they lend. So if the theory of this was that we have a short-term lending crisis, you would have thought we would have asked these people to lend. And what did John Thain say from Bank of America? He said he doesn't think they intend to lend. They're, they're, they're hoarding cash because they may have more loan losses and they want to make sure that. Yeah, so it doesn't actually really address the problem at all except for perhaps keeping the banks from It keeps the banks from going under, but it doesn't necessarily allow all these other institutions to get the cash that they need to. Okay, excellent point. So if you had a properly designed thing, what about the executive comp part of, of the, uh, those nine banks had to agree to what was purported to be a very tough regime on executive comp. So will we see people from Goldman and people from Bank of America, and even you guys, will any of you be making $10 million next year or $20 million? Any of these people are gonna be able to make $20 million? <coughs> Any of these people going to be able to leave for bad performance and get $9 million? You're sh people are shaking their heads, no, I, the answer is yes. So 
Who? Who? Anyone know about this? Anyone? Yes, Andrew. It's, it's something like the top five. Things. Okay, first of all, only the restrictions only apply to the top five. I don't think anyone in this room is yet ready to be in the top I five at Goldman. Goldman. So Goldman. if the trader wants to make 30 million, okay. I think Goldman on its most recent earnings call has already set aside 11 or 12 billion dollars for compensation this year. Okay, so first of all, it only applies to the top five. Then let's even talk about the top five. Suppose that, Andrew, we pay you $3 million a year for three years. And at the end of the three years, we decide, actually, you're not any good at all. We ask you to leave. So we're going to give you a golden parachute of $9 million. Is that OK? Even though you're taking money from the government? I think so. It is OK. Why? You're right. Why? Because all the legislation says is you can't give in a, you can't do two things. You can't create a new golden parachute. But if your golden parachute was there before, it's okay. And second of all, you can't pay someone more than three times their annual salary. So you are making three million, and I'm sorry, but you screwed up, and we gave you nine million on the way out. How do you think people are going to react to that? Not a bad deal. Not a bad deal. What other executive comp? Anyone else? Well, you're not supposed to have excessive risk. So those traders are going to make 20 or 30 billion, million. No excessive risk. What, how is that defined? No one is even trying to define that. Take my word for it. And let's go back to the bank situation. What's the other condition that they didn't put on these banks? There's no lending requirement. And what's the other condition that you think that, for instance, UK put on and other people might have you might think you're trying to conserve capital. You're trying not to have these banks go over. So if you were writing the conditions, what might you put? Yes? Let's think about dividends. No dividends. But can they give dividends? They are allowed to. They are allowed to do dividends. They can do dividends the same as they used to, taking money on it. In fact, can they just take the money from the government and pay it out as dividends? Absolutely OK, as long as they don't increase their dividends, right? Now, a lot of people have a problem with that. Because even if you're supposed to be conserving capital, it doesn't seem like a good idea to pay out dividends. Is there a rationale for dividends? Interestingly, UK didn't let its banks that it recapitalized pay out dividends. And its bank stock all went down. The US, when they gave the money and they said you could pay dividends, they all went up. So what's the argument? Yes? I think it's when you pay out dividends, it's basically your stockholders are getting ahead of your creditors. Because if the bank get, goes bankrupt, then... Oh, yes. Paying out dividends is giving money to your stockholders before your creditors. So that's why the UK said they didn't want to do it. Is, did the US just make a mistake? They just did something terrible? Those guys from Goldman weren't so smart, even though they were working for the Treasury. Is there any rationale for allowing dividends to continue? There is. There is. Stock market value. Excuse me? Keeps the stock market going. Well, keeps the stock market going. That, that doesn't help the Treasury that much. What specifically does Treasury want to happen here? Yes? There's a feedback loop between the share price and also what people perceive as the viability of the bank. So, for example, when Morgan Stanley's share price kept tanking, people are more and more afraid to trade with Morgan Stanley, and there will be, be like a run on the bank itself. So. There's incentive for the government not to want the shares of the share price of the banks. To keep okay, well that's true, but there's a more specific thing that Treasury wants. More specific thing that Treasury wants to happen here. What do they want to happen? They put this 125 billion in. What what do they what do they want to happen? Yes. They they would like to attract more capital. Yeah, they want to get the 125 billion back, and they want these banks to raise more capital. The reason why this is a good thing besides that is that the banks can lever this money more than direct than the TARP can. I mean, buying assets is one thing, but having a bank be able to lever uh, the balance sheet, which is asset collateral. Okay, so, so it, it, to the extent we had a lending requirement, that might actually make sense. But the idea is that you don't want to constrain the bank from raising new capital. You want them to raise new capital and pay back your preferred as soon as possible. You also want them to raise new capital and have their stock price go up so your warrants as the government are worth so. So that's the argument for dividends. And in fact, I believe that the UK will change its rule and will allow dividends to be paid. 
uh, because of that. Now, I still want to get to troubled assets because, we, we, I mean, it's $450 billion. So you're, you're, we now have bids out. We've already appointed Bank of New York Mellon is the custodian for this program. There are 100 managers who are now vying to be hired by the Treasury. Full disclosure, MFS is one of them, to be hired to get involved with buying all these troubled assets. So what's the deal here? Is that a good idea? Anyone for or against that idea? Well, one of the questions I should ask, yes? So in terms of getting rid of, it'd be good if you could get rid of all these assets because there's an issue of transparency, not knowing what's on the, what's on the bank's um, balance sheet. But it seems like $400 billion isn't anywhere close to being able to buy up all these assets. So it's more. Well, what are, what are we referring to as these assets? Well, so all these um, assets, those underlying values, all these, uh, the CDOs. Okay, so where are these assets now? Well, some of them are on the bank's balance sheet. <laughs> some, right. And some are in, I don't know much about them, there are these what, structured vehicles that are sort of Okay, so some of them are in these pools. These are mortgage-backed pools, and they have a number of tranches, right? So if you buy up these, these supposing, how, how are you going to buy these up now? Well, they were talking about a reverse auction. A reverse auction. That is exactly right. Reverse auction usually goes that you say, I have a billion dollars to spend. Everybody submit bids to sell, excuse me, offers to sell. And then you pick the lowest ones, right? So does that work here? Well, one problem is they're trying to do it quickly, but because all the, they're all sort of bound by these thick contracts, it's hard to really value them. Well, correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but if I said this today, I said I want to spend a billion dollars for a reverse auction in General Electric bonds maturing in 2015. How fast do you think I could do that reverse auction? Uh, General Electric, probably pretty quickly. Very quickly. So, what's the difference here? It would be the same with IBM. The same with anybody. Well, each one of these is like its own company. So it's, yeah, that's right. Each pool is unique. The difference is each of these mortgage pools are unique. And in fact, people spend a lot of time analyzing each pool because each pool has its own set of mortgages and it has its own documents, as you said. So uh, it takes you a long time to figure that out, right? And you don't have that many holders in each pool. So it's not like you have lots and lots of sellers. So, and then. One of the other obligations, remember, was to get, when you get the mortgages, when you get these mortgages, then the government was supposed to make its best efforts to modify them. If the government buys these three tranches, will it be able to modify the mortgages here? No, because there's still two other holders that... Have That's been. right. There are two others. And does every, and everybody owns an undivided, you know, it's, it's a sort of a slice. This owns a slice, this owns a slice. So... One of the interesting things is this, that Hank Paulson started as troubled assets as his big deal. That's what he was going to do. And in fact, many people, including myself, apparently including Bernanke, told him that's not a good idea. It's not a good idea because it can take a very long time for you to do this. These are all separate pools. They all have to be analyzed. And it's going to take a long, long time, and we're never going to know whether we have the right price. It's not like the general reverse auctions. And second of all, if you're lucky enough to get some of these mortgage-backed securities, it doesn't lend itself very easily to modify the mortgages. So that's why he decided to go to recapitalization and realized that recapitalization of banks was a sentence that Barney threw in, Barney Frank threw in at the last moment into the legislation. It wasn't actually there in the early parts of the legislation. So let's see if we have, yes? When you advised him that you didn't think that was a good idea, did you have an offer? I, I didn't advise him personally. I published something. Sure. OK, same difference, though, right? Did you have like a Well, I don't know whether he read my article. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a spouse, that's not a good idea to do. Actually, two questions. So first of all, if you don't think that's a good idea, do you think there is like an alternate better idea? Are you, are you saying that recapitalization Right answer. And before you answer that, also, <laughs> is it really critical that you do this in a timely fashion, or is it just critical that you provide the market with assurance that it's going to happen? And the, the assurance in a timely fashion. 
Well, I think that the answer to your second question, which is a reasonable question, is assurance goes part of the way, but it'd be a lot better if it actually happened, because the theory is that these troubled assets are going to be bought from banks, and then they're going to have cash instead of troubled assets. And then what are they going to do with that cash? But what are they supposed to do with it? Blend it. That's the theory. So we have the same defect in the theory because they, they forgot to say, once you get the cash, you have to lend it. And in fact, who are going to, there's a $300 million exemption, meaning if you sell troubled assets and you sell more than $300 million of troubled assets to the federal government, you come under all of these executive comp and all these other conditions. Now, it's one thing if somebody gives me $25 billion, then I'm definitely willing to accept whatever conditions they want. <laughs> But if I just sold $300 million, who do you, what types of banks do you think are going to participate in this troubled asset program? Strong ones or weak ones? Weak ones. Weak ones. So the weak ones are going to come in. They're going to do it. And will they spend the money? Will they lend it? No, they'll especially not lend it because they really have long loss problem. So the fact is, most of the, when this legislation actually passed on Friday, the market dropped by 150 points because people in the new know said, if this whole thing with reverse auctions is supposed to get everything going, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in so many different ways. It's just not feasible. So over the weekend, Paulson threw away his ideological concerns. Do you know that his nickname now is Hugo Chavez Paulson? <laughs> <laughs> now, just think about it. <clears throat> If Hugo Chavez had nationalized nine banks, plus AIG, Lehman Brothers, we would have said, what a crazy socialist dictator, like in Colombia, right? <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Here we have the, head, the former head of Goldman Sachs, who's nationalizing every bank in sight. And, and of course, he was a little reluctant to do it. But he had just begun to come to Congress. He had just said, oh, I need all the 700 billion, and then, a number of people, and Bernanke whispered in here, he says, they're actually right. This reverse auction is ridiculous. It doesn't work. And so he had to do something, right? Everybody's waiting for it. Do something. The market dropped. Everyone said, you can't do this. So there it is. Nationalize a few more banks, right? Nope. I guess the question that is still on everybody's mind is, OK, that's not the answer. Everybody can throw stones at it and say, yeah, that doesn't work. But what does? Well, uh, and I think we're coming to an end here. I guess we haven't. We haven't <laughs> Carl, Carl told me this is the end, so it has to be the end. So I think we can say, for, we haven't even gotten into a lot of stuff with short selling and the SEC and other things. So, and what, what, has, what, do, what has worked? The one thing that has worked, one of the things that has worked is the Fed has really opened up its discount window to allowing all sorts of institutions to borrow from it, and that does create liquidity. Before the Fed was very picky, you could sort of treasuries or agency securities and they lend you. Now, they have asset-backed securities. You give them asset-backed securities, they give you back treasuries. Unbelievable. So that produces liquidity. And it increased it, not only asset-backed securities, now you can put CP, commercial paper. They'll loan you on that. In fact, if General Electric wants to issue CP, it can issue it directly to the Fed. So the Fed has really increased its balance sheet and has contributed a huge amount to short-term liquidity. And so that was a very positive thing. A second thing is that we guaranteed money market funds, and they were on runs. And we did it, hopefully, only for a very short period of time. Uh, and now they, hopefully, will be able to buy some more short-term paper. So we've done a lot for the short-term market, and hopefully the spread between three-month <coughs> treasuries and three-month LIBOR, which had gotten up to 6 or 7%, is usually about a half a percent will come down. So I think we are actually on our way to dealing with the short-term debt problem. Now, what else should be done is, you know, I think, unfortunately, as people have pointed out, very little has been done for the mortgage holder. In the long term, none of these things are going to be worth anything unless the mortgage holder can pay. And so we really haven't addressed this issue. 
And this issue is huge. We, in many countries, they've guaranteed all debt. You know you can go to the FDIC now and for a fee, as a bank, they will guarantee all bonds that you put out. Same thing in Germany, same thing in Ireland, same thing in these countries. So we're taking on huge risk. If this is just a liquidity problem, we're okay. But if the assets don't come back over three or four years, we are in trouble. We and every other country in Europe is in trouble. So I agree with the people who are arguing that we need to do something for these people, and we need to sort out who are the people who we feel are appropriate, worthy. I mean, we're willing to pick out of all the banks which ones we're going to recapitalize. We should be able to develop criteria, because if we don't deal with this housing problem, all this other stuff isn't going to help. So first, we need to deal with the liquidity problem. And we actually have been doing a pretty good job of that. But in the long term, we have to deal with the housing problem. And in between, we probably need to do a lot of different things with the Fed and the SEC. For instance, the Fed is now bailing out everybody. Pretty soon, you know, the supermarket's going to be in there. What jurisdiction does the Fed have? The Fed doesn't have jurisdiction over hedge funds. It has no jurisdiction over private equity funds. It has no jurisdiction over insurance companies. If the Fed is going to bail out people, it should start to have monitoring and systemic risk jurisdiction over many of these institutions. Another thing we see is the credit default market. It's 50, 50, it's a 50 to $60 trillion market. We don't even know who owns the stuff. There's no netting, there's no clearing. We could solve that problem. We could solve that problem by legislation that would pass and say, there is now going to be an exchange. You can't trade all this stuff over the counter. You've got to go through an exchange. So there are intermediate things you can do. So I'll end by saying this. In the short term, you've got to address the freezing of those debt markets. And we have started to do it led by the Fed. And we've done, I think, a pretty reasonable job. We have actually done very little for the long-term problem of the housing crisis and the homeowner. And there are literally whole neighborhoods that are going down the tubes in places in which they will be very hard to salvage. The difficulty is there are lots of them who are the worthy ones who are not. We see one man, gentleman, says shouldn't have more than 80% loan to value. Lots of different opinions. The reality is these are difficult choices, but we're now going to choose for the hundred, second 125 billion out of all banks in the United States, which ones? So we figured out how to do that. There are no published criteria, by the way. Uh, so we ought to be able to figure out how to do that. And in between, we need to expand the Fed's jurisdiction uh, to deal with this. We need to probably reshape the SEC's jurisdiction. We need to rethink short selling, maybe back, bring back what's called the uptick rule uh, and certain things like that. I don't think we have time to go into all this. Otherwise, Carl will give me. Uh, 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 some uh, difficulties, and uh, all I can say is think about, you know, think about the problem and think about how we solve the problem. If you understand the problem for what it is, you'll see there are lots of accounting issues too. Should we allow banks to have all this stuff off balance sheet? Should we allow mortgage brokers to sell all this stuff and keep no skin in the game? You know, maybe they should be required to hold on to 10% of the mortgage. Maybe that's the way you get them to be more serious about what they're going to do. So there are lots and lots of things. But what's interesting is the piece of legislation that passed, the cornerstone of that piece of legislation is buy up troubled assets. And there's no one, even Hank Paulson, who believes that that's really a good idea. So it would have been nice if we worked the other way. We thought about it for a while. We came up with an intelligent piece of legislation, and then we passed it. So we passed the piece of legislation, but luckily it had this clause in there which somebody then said you could go and recapitalize all those banks. Is it a good idea to recapitalize these nine banks? Do you realize that Wells Fargo didn't want to be recapitalized? They didn't want to do this. They were forced to take the program, just so no one would feel bad, no one would be stigmatized. So this is an ad hoc pro problem. And if I had to say in one phrase, what, how do we describe the government's response here, I would say behind the curve, behind the curve. Thank you.